up close, I'm Stephen I. Weiss. We're looking at the Israeli immigrant experience from two very different perspectives in this week's episode. For many young Jews immigrating to Israel today, the hope of finding a Jewish mate is a major goal. The mix of disappointments around that search is the topic of a short story collection by Yael Unterman, The Hidden of Things. Meanwhile, from a political and ideological perspective, many immigrants these days find themselves identifying with the writings of the man perhaps most responsible for the development of Israel's right wing, Zev Jabotinsky. But a new biography by Hillel Hawken paints Jabotinsky in a new light. But first, here's my interview with Yal Unterman. Singles. <laughs> Jewish singles. Orthodox Jewish singles. Talk about how that single scene develops over there. Oh, well, I'm not sure how it developed. Um, weirdly enough, actually, my parents lived in probably the proto-single scene there about 40 years ago, but um, they were lucky enough to find each other. Um, I think that just um, English-speaking people gravitated to those neighborhoods of Katamon, Rehavia, because they were just lovely neighborhoods. They are full of what we call Anglo-Saxons, right, English-speaking immigrants. And many of those were single, and somehow the, the concentration of singles in Jerusalem does tend to be around those areas of uh, Jerusalem, of, of Rehavia, Katamon, and Baka. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how these things develop. It's actually a sociological question. There really is, is this is almost like a, an anth it's an anthropological topic. There is a community here, a tribe with customs, etc. And, and in your first story, you talk about specifically that idea of what happens when all of a sudden there's, there's the most minimal touching on a yeah. date and how that, for these extremely orthodox people, it can, it can be jarring. Jarring, uh, dramatic, sensual, you know, um, they're very, very sensitized. And there's something beautiful about that. Um, when, you know, in, in today's world, you know, sex has become very, very cheap and very easy. And uh, when you watch a movie, you expect the heroes to jump into bed within, you know, the first few minutes of getting to know each other. And, and here you've got a society where, yeah, in my first story, there is a woman who is not at all is not at all expecting to be touched by men, and when somebody comes close with something even the least bit intimate, it affects her profoundly. And there is there's something amazing about that. And well, that's and that's also one of the more disturbing things because investing in yourself in a sense and and figuring out who you really want to be would seem to be a step, a first step towards coupling off, not some step after you've failed at coupling off, right? Right, right, you're right, and there's a problem there. In other words, the messages that are given by society are, uh, yeah, go to college, prepare yourself for a career, and to women maybe start to prepare yourself, you know, to be a mother. And there's an expectation probably that it will happen soon afterwards. And I don't think su sufficient guidelines are provided for people to just start building and creating themselves. In fact, people might be scared to do that, to start really investing in who they are, because what if I meet someone whose life trajectory is different, especially probably for women, you know, whose role still, even, look, in modern circles, the role of women is changing in modern Jewish circles, but the role still is probably more expected to be secondary to, let's say, the husband's job or whatever. And so if they invest in themselves and create a, a glorious career, what happens when they get married and they have to stop it because of the children, etc.? So that's in the back of a lot of people's minds. And yet, on the other hand, I do believe that today there's lots of, there are lots of young men and women who are just setting out to be who they are in the world and want to meet someone from within that. And probably many of them don't actually want to meet someone when they're 22 because they don't feel that they'll be ready yet. Their ideal age is probably more like you know, 26 or you know, beyond that when they've already started to establish themselves. And, and unfortunately, what they find is that they are now 30 and 35 and 40. And you know, this, this, is, this, this thing is still not happening. It's like waiting for a train that doesn't show up. It's how do I move on to that next chapter that seems so obvious? And it's not just about society. It's about an internal need to, to just build a home with someone. And now, re-examining the life and writings of Zeb Jabotinsky, Hillel Halkin. To the degree that, uh, that Jabotinsky is thought of today, it's, it's, I'd say, often as this far-right figure who uh, is, on, on the one hand, from today's far-right in Israel, is seen as a source of inspiration. And on the other hand, on the left, he's seen as the far-right source of inspiration. Jabotinsky has really suffered from two stereotypes. Uh, he suffered from the stereotypes of his enemies on the left, 
or his detractors on the left, and he suffered equally in many ways from the stereotypes of his admirers on the right, because both have simplified him and turned him into a very two-dimensional figure, whether it's the super patriot, fire-breathing patriot of, of, of his right-wing admirers, the unyielding Jewish nationalist, uh, the militant defender of Jewish causes, or whether it's the uh, right-wing semi-fascist demagogue that the left has made him out to be. In either case, these are absurd simplifications. He was a much more complicated and interesting figure. But he was an advocate for militarism. He was a prophet of war, a, a leader of soldiers, or of fighters. Uh, and so uh, what was he doing there? And how, is the, and how, did we get it, how do you think we got it wrong? Jabotinsky was about the first, he was the first major Zionist leader already before the First World War, and certainly more explicitly in the early 1920s, who understood that the uh, Jewish-Arab conflict in Palestine, which was already you know, beginning to rev up at that point, would end in war and had to end in war. Uh, the Zionist left, which was the dominant force in Zionist politics in those years, and the Zionist establishment really cultivated the illusion that the Arabs could be pacified or placated or bought off with economic progress or uh, social investment or plain bribery. And uh, Jabotinsky from the very beginning said no. Uh, and he the actually, Arabs yeah. are going to fight. And, and he said this in, in many ways out of great respect for the Arabs. I mean, the point he made was that no normal people lets its land be taken away from it by another people without fighting. And the Arabs are a normal people with a normal, healthy sense of self-respect, and they're not going to give this country to us without a fight. And he was really the first who understood that. In your conclusion, you imagine a conversation between you and, uh, and Zev Jabotinsky. If he were to descend from the heavens or what have you and, and, and sit across from you at a cafe, uh, what kind of conversation you guys would have, a and what is that like? Well, first of all, it's a very friendly conversation. Jabotinsky, uh, despite his reputation as being this great authoritarian uh, leader, you know, this this great, uh, and there, there, there was a whole, there was a cult of the personality which formed around him in his own movement, the right wing party called the Revisionists, uh, and he was very much revered by by his followers. But he was a very personable man. He was not a man with airs. He was a man uh, who showed great respect for everyone around him, from the secretaries in his office to his political colleagues to his political enemies. He was a man of impeccable manners, very friendly. And uh, so it was very easy talking to him, even though he was dead, because he was, even as a dead man, he was very gracious and uh, very forth, forthright and forthcoming with me. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable, or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under premium channels. For more information, visit tjctv.com.